Hey, it's Jamie from thedailyinfusion.com where you can learn how to reclaim health, create wellness, and transform your life. I am so honored to be joined by Nancy Fish today who is a licensed psychotherapist, has a master's in public health, and is the co-author of the book Healing Painful Sex, A Woman's Guide to Confronting, Diagnosing, and Treating Sexual Pain. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I feel very honored to be here. Oh, the pleasure is mine. So what I wanted to discuss today is what are we talking about when we talk about the subject sexual pain and the book that you wrote, Healing Painful Sex. Why were you prompted to write that and what is that about? I basically, when I wrote that book, it was became a mission for me and it's, it actually saved my life. I became a pelvic or sexual pain patient in 2006 and basically because I had such a, a harrowing journey finding the right doctor, finding the right diagnosis and finding the right treatment um, and I, and also I, I began to work with other women who had gone through that those particular experiences. I felt it became my mission to, to help other women and actually men who were dealing with the same health issues. Um, I, I co-wrote it, co-authored it with Dr. Deborah Cody, who's one of the country's renowned, um, most renowned experts in this area. And I, I be, was her patient, and then at one point she basically said, why don't we write a book together about this? And it took you know, about five years to put it together because we both took it very seriously. Um, and the, the, what really promised, our first title was going to be, It's Not In Your Head, mm. because we find that most women and men are blamed for their pain and, and are thought and are led to believe that it's psychosomatic. And what, what I have found and what Dr. Cody has found is that, yeah, there are some times that emotional issues and psychological issues will lead to a, a person's pelvic or sexual pain. But for the most part, we have found that there are medical causes for, you know, for for genital pain, for sexual pain, for pelvic pain. And most of the emotional or, or psychological challenges are a result of the pain. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if people have had, people who've had a lot of trauma in their life, they are, they might be predisposed to being, feeling more pain than others. Mm -hmm. Because when you're, when you're, when you've suffered for, from trauma, um, traumatic events, it does affect your central nervous system, which mm -hmm. then, make you more prone to feel pain or 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 experience or have a, or, or or trauma can make you more predisposed to developing a, a physical condition mm -hmm. but i have found that most women and men have these emotional um, emotions and, and psychological issues as a result of the pain um, and, and the other the other reason that we wrote this book is because there is such ignorance in the medical community about how to treat pain in general and um, sexual pain. But it's it's amazing. But I would say like the vast majority of gynecologists have no understanding or awareness about pain. And this is and, and Doctor Doctor Cody's educated me, so I feel like I can say this. This is a doctor who has um, you know gave me this information. She, that most gynecologists, you know, although are very well intentioned, do not go into this to deal with sexual pain or pain. They deal with it to deal, you know, with, with obstetric issues or gynecological issues. So they're not equipped to deal with with pain, or they're not educated, and that's not even their focus. So when a woman comes in and, and reports feeling, you know, pain during sex, the first thing that that the doctor's going to think of, or the pain with sitting because of um, you know, pain in the genital region. The first of the things the doctor, most doctors are going to think of is, okay, what, you know, what, what's this woman getting hysterical about or what's, what psychological issues does she have? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for, there are so many different medical conditions that can cause um, pain. A lot of people have autoimmune diseases. People have Lyme disease. Um, most people who have some kind of an autoimmune disease will have some some pain in the in the general region. Um, 
there were different um, different medical conditions. I'll just name a few, like vestibulodynia. There's primary vestibulodynia, there's secondary vestibulodynia, there's clitorodynia. There's nerve. There's pelvic floor dysfunction, which which happens when the pelvic floor muscles get tightened, and that you know that can happen to many people. Some people can have pelvic floor muscles that tighten, and it doesn't. It doesn't cause any symptoms. Some people have it and it causes you know, terrible pain in the vulva vaginal region. There's nerve pain, which is caused by compression of, you know, of the nerve because of tight muscles. So there are so many different um, reasons that people have, you know, genital pain or sexual pain. So the reason I, this, I, I wrote the two two you know there are two reasons I wrote it. One is because I, I felt it was my mission, you know, as, a, as a, I felt I, I was a psychotherapist before I became, uh, before I developed this condition. And I, I felt it really that I, they owed it to women to be there to help them because I really understand it. And, and I wanted to help people educate the, 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 the patient community, the medical community, and really help women empower themselves and advocate for themselves. Because I think what happens is whenever you become ill and you have a chronic condition or a pain condition, it's so disempowering. Mm. And that, I think, is my biggest message to women. And I, and I think that, um, Jamie, you and I feel the same way about this, mm. is really how to empower yourself and how not to become your illness or not to become your condition. You may have a condition, you may have pain, but that is not you. So that's really what my, my, my book is about, and that's really what how I practice. Mm, it's so well said. And so when, when people contact you, what are the kinds of situations that you're seeing? Uh, how is it affecting them emotionally? What are you dealing with when it comes to the people that call you? Well, I would say that when, I, when people come to me, it, the pain, the sexual pain affects every aspect of their life. Well, their, their work situation, their intimate relationships, their relationships with their children, relationships with partners. If women are, are looking to date or, or, you know, they, it affects their dating. So it affects every single aspect of their life. Most people suffer from depression, anxiety, a sense of despondency. I often have people have suicidal thinking, not that they want to commit suicide or even that they're even inclined to do that, but it's a, it's a sort of a coping mechanism, a way to, to say that, well, if, I, if this pain doesn't end, then there's something I could do about it. So it's very common what, that, that, I, you know, that, that, that women or, or men will be talking to me about you know, suicidal thoughts. Um, I, I find that people feel very invalidated. So what, one of the things that I do, the first thing that I do is validate people's feelings. So let them know that it's okay that they have these feelings and, 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 not, and they're not going crazy. M many people feel like they're, they're going crazy. I deal with a lot of trauma from, that's, that's inflicted by the medical community. I think that one, one thing I see is post-traumatic stress disorder just because of, of how people are treated by the medical community. And I think that's something that definitely the chronic illness community can relate with for sure as well. Any chronic illness. Mm -hmm. you know. So with the medical trauma, you're seeing people who have been right flat out dismissed by their doctors that there's nothing wrong, even though they're sitting there and there are physical symptoms. Right. I, I've, I see people who are told that there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. It's in your head or given a misdiagnosis. I feel that, Many doctors, I wouldn't say all, but many doctors would rather give a misdiagnosis than feel than tell patients that they don't know what's wrong. Yeah. Mm. So I, that's so I feel like it's like they have to reach into their uh, they reach into their ma you know medical magic hat and they say okay you know I don't really know what's going on but I'm going to come up with a, a diagnosis. So I I feel that I would say 99 to 100 percent of my patients have been mistreated by physicians and not because not because it's that definitely all physicians are set and sensitive it's just they feel very helpless and they feel like they have to give people an answer even if it's the wrong answer right. and uh you know and i think that unfortunately the way the the uh, insurance system is set up or managed care system is set up doctors are given very little time they're very over overloaded and they don't have the time to really you know to take to to understand you know what their patients conditions are and i do think that a lot of women and i think there have been studies that have shown this 
that women's pain is not taken as seriously and that women are looked at as more hysterical. So I think there have been, I know that there's definitely, I don't remember the exact study, but there was a study that came out that, um, that there are many people who go undiagnosed with, you know, with autoimmune diseases or other chronic diseases that are um, they're misdiagnosed and that women's pain is, it's, you know, it's like women are, are thought to be complainers, so they're not taken as seriously. So a lot of the work that I do is just helping people empower themselves and to understand that, you know, to understand that it's not, it's not just not to stop blaming themselves and stop feeling so victimized by these doctors, that these doctors, that there are good doctors out there. You can find good health, health practitioners out there. And if you don't like the way you're treated, then you have to find somebody else. Nobody should be subjected to you know, inhumane treatment or improper treatment. Amen to that. I know for myself, just going through years and years of misdiagnoses, and I can I can understand that need for that answer because the patients want the answers. We want the answers. And so, of course, the doctors are going to feel the pressure to give them to us. But really, what it comes down to is we just want to be heard. We just want right. to, someone to acknowledge that this is happening. This is our reality. And right. that we want to figure out how can we cope with this reality now that it exists. And you can't tell me that it doesn't exist because I know it does. And once we just get that piece, it's like then the healing can really begin. Right, right. It's very well stated. So what, how would you walk us through with how treating this? What would, what would a session look like in terms of what is focused on when we're dealing with sexual pain? Well, I guess it really depends on what state the, the, um, the, my client is in. Most people who come to see me are in a state of crisis. Mm. So a lot of it's just crisis intervention initially. And then I use a lot of cognitive behavioral techniques. So what I, 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 what I try to help people do is, well, first of all, I, I, I let them know I'm their advocate. I'm there for them during the session, outside of the session too. And I'm there to speak with their other healthcare practitioners. So because people need an advocate. Absolutely. But a big part of what I do is help people reframe the way they look at their situation and the way, that we, the way they deal with their situation. So for example, if somebody says, you know, well, tell me, I just cannot get out of bed. I, it's, I'm in too much pain to move. I try to help people understand that they don't, you know, that they're, they're not their illness and that they can do things to empower themselves. Um, it can be a small thing. For example, some people just taking a walk around the block once a day is a big deal. I look at everybody. I look at where people are and, and I try to understand that everybody's got different situations or different coping skills, but it's always comes from the position of trying to empower people. But I also let people know that they have a right to their feelings and the, and, you know, and a right to feel depressed and anxious and sad at times because it's really it's too difficult. I mean, you can't when 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 people are told they have to be take a positive attitude, it doesn't mean that you're not entitled to your feel. Yeah. So I to, so there's a lot of validating saying yes, you need to let people know there are times you you have to be gentle with yourself. And that it's okay to be suicidal too. That if you have those feelings, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you or, or terribly gone wrong. That that's okay to be sad, right. to be right. in despair. Right? How could you not be? Of you know, course. when you're in pain, it's it's it it feels it's horrible. Mm -hmm. When you're in that kind of a pain, um, it's not normal to be in chronic pain. It's not okay. so. Again, there's a lot of validation that goes on. A validation empowering, reframing the way you. You look at things. So, for example, not to minimize something that you do. Um, you know, for if if you can take a, uh, a ride in the car for five minutes one day, and, and you know, and, and like the day before you couldn't do that, that's a big deal. So, I I don't minimize. I, do, I tell I tell people there are no baby steps. Every step is significant. Mm. To look at and not not minimize the things that that not minimize things. So look at everything that happens in your life as a, as a big deal. If somebody reaches out to you or you have a, a an emotional connection with another person, that's a big deal. So I think that that's one thing that I, I do that with all my clients because I think that people tend to minimize what happens in their life. So if you make, I ask people to keep journals often so they can look back to where they were. And there's, you know, I actually I had a patient 
just the, the other day or a client who, who was, she's really, you know, she has newly diagnosed with a, a condition that's been misdiagnosed for a long time. Um, but she's not where she wants to be, but she said, well, her father just said, look, look, at you, look what you couldn't do three months ago and what you're doing now. Mm. So I ask people to look, look at their whole situation and, and try to reframe and not always look and say, okay, I'm in terrible pain right now, but two hours from now, three hours from now, I might not be. So it's, it's a very hard journey. You cannot do this alone. You can't do this without support. Mm. If you don't have support from friends or family, then you need to reach out to some somebody. And that's one thing. We have a, a whole chapter in a book, but you can't do this alone. I think Jamie, you, you you know that you yeah. need you need support because Absolutely. it's 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 really like doing this without support is like climbing Mount Everest without without climbing tools. So it's yeah, because we have the weight of our own judgment on it too. So it isn't just we're fearing how we're viewed by the world, but we're holding on to this thing that we judge ourselves for because we haven't gotten the validation yet. Maybe right. we don't know anybody else who has it, and so we feel like defective or there's something right. off about us that we're just holding on to, and and no one else can know. And to hold on to that, that's that weighs us down. It brings right. us more lower and, and we're a little more depressed because of it when we're isolated like that right right that sense of isolation that yeah, I, i'm sure you see that also i think that mm -hmm. sense of isolation is, is is really debilitating but i love what you said about that celebrating all of those achievements because i'm all about those micro movements that if all you can do is wiggling your toes in bed and that's the exercise you do for the day great celebrate that you wiggled your toes like everything that the more you can make it a celebration and you get in that habit you're training your brain to recognize that right that's exactly right you're you're so right because people don't understand a lot you have a choice in how you want to deal with your situation um it's and it's again like you said retraining your brain mm -hmm. you know this is chronic pain changes your central nervous system. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when you're in pain for such a long time, the volume control in your in your pain is, is stuck high. So for example, for example, your your car radio, let's say you had your volume switch and you couldn't turn it down. Well, that's what it's like with being in chronic pain. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that you can do things to change that, to lower that volume. It takes a lot of work, but it, you, know, you can't do it just with Western medicine technique alone. I mean, medic, med Medicine is required and necessary, but it really takes a whole integrative approach using mindfulness, using meditation, nutrition, mm. you know, different holistic remedies. It really, I, the, the, you can't just take a pain pill and make it go away. That's not going to work. And unfortunately, that's what it's come. There's a, um, there's a, a book that I just read that I highly recommend by Judy Foreman called The Nation in Pain. And she also talks about how our country deals with pain, and we deal with it by giving narcotics and opioids. Yeah. And yes, at some points they are necessary. I'm not disagreeing, but after a while, these medications were not meant to treat chronic pain, and that's become the answer. You have pain, take an opioid, take a narcotic. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times these um, they become counter-effective. They actually sometimes they create more pain receptors in the brain. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, not to say I would never tell anybody that they shouldn't, they, I've never questioned what their doctor tells them, but what I ask them to do is to think more integratively about their care. So, um, and one thing is that when you have pain is getting outside of yourself. So, for example, when, when somebody, when I treat a, a, a client, and I said, well, you know what, when I'm talking to you, I'm not really thinking about that. Pain. Well, that's the other thing. When you're engaged in activities outside of yourself, then you're not thinking about your pain. Mm -hmm. Not to mean that you don't need to rest. People need to rest and to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. It's very true, and it's it really all comes down to the way I see it. We are a nation that's just really uncomfortable with with pain in general. Of course, because it's painful physically, but also to witness other people in pain is something we're tremendously uncomfortable with as a nation. So it seems like the medical model has sort of followed that cover the band-aid, cover it over, wash it over, so we don't have to hear you crying, but it doesn't change any of the situation of what's causing that. Right. So the more we can actually get comfortable with the pain, the more we can actually empower ourselves to move through it. But we don't get to move through anything we don't allow ourselves to feel. Right. It just doesn't happen. 
And so if you're taking painkillers, yeah, you might be numbed out, but stuff's still going on in your body that's creating the situation that's there in the background. You know, it's, it's still there. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing about that I deal with, with, and that's a very good point, but with sexual pain, because it affects, and I think with all pain, all pain affects your ability to have sex. I think you, they try to work with patients is that re, until they're able to have penetrative sex or intercourse, there are so many different things that you can do to remain intimate with your, your partner um, or to be able to date when you're looking for, for you know, when you're, when, when you're single. So there are all different ways. I, I, I think sex has become, the word sex has become synonymous with intercourse. And there are so many different parts to sex. I mean, there's, you can have, you can have intercourse a hundred times a day and have no intimacy, but with people, there are so many different ways to maintain in, intimacy. So I, I work a lot on that with, with clients. I sometimes, a lot of times work with couples. If I'm seeing a, a woman, her partner will often come into to sessions. So we can talk about that. The other aspect is, Helping validate other people's feelings in your life. People validate other people's feelings who are in your life. For example, if you're watching somebody in pain, it's very painful and you feel very helpless and out of control. So it's important that you ask the people in your life how they're feeling, how they're dealing with it. Mm. So I know that if there's just a lot of validation that, that needs to go on, reframing the way you look at things. And figuring out, like, like you said, how to celebrate the moments in your life. The moments are more important. Those are the things that really make your life significant. Not always the big things, but the smaller moments. Right. And in a way, the sexual pain almost serves as a motivator for intimacy because it forces people to communicate in a way that maybe they otherwise wouldn't have spoken up that they weren't enjoying themselves as much. I mean, forget if they even have pain. People don't always communicate when they're having sex and they're supposedly healthy. You know, right. they don't always right. communicate what they're what they're feeling. So right. this is another way to reframe the situation that is now forcing maybe you and your partner or forcing us, if we're single, to really speak our needs in a relationship, which is right. very important for everyone. Right, right, right. You're right. Because even people who don't have pain, um, there's a, a lot of lack of communication. And just the whole idea. I mean, I, I just, I, don't, I often tell people, please don't look for books. Or, or movies or TV shows as your um, prototype for what it's supposed to be you know, like your sex life is supposed to be like because yeah. it's really it's it's very rarely like that it, it, it everybody's different everybody's sexual needs are different everybody's desires are different and everybody's situation is different it's true so if there were one tip we could leave everyone with today for what's your number one way of really that step between you're feeling really awful to get out of it, to, to turn your mind out of that trauma mode, what, what would it be? That's a very good question and it's a hard question. Yeah. So I'd like to think about that for a moment. Go ahead. What I would like to tell people is you are not your illness, you are not your condition, you are not your pain. You have every reason to feel hopeful the goal is always not to get out of the, out of your pain, but to make your life to, to put the often put the pain in the background. For some people, I hope that pain becomes invisible and it's something that that is not part of your life. But it is. If it is part of your life, don't let it define you. And find ways to empower yourself. Mm -hmm. And 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 don't do it alone. Right. Thank you. Great tips. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope we get to have you on again. And I'm sure our audience is leaving with wonderful messages that will really Thank help Thank you them. so much. And I think all the work that you're doing, Jamie, is amazing. Mm, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Very inspirational. Hmm, thank you. So we'll talk with you soon. And thanks, everyone, for joining me. And please leave a comment below if you have any other questions or concerns or anything you want to add. We're here to serve. Thanks.